I'm um, just letting some more people into the room. So just imagine that you've turned up at Avid Reader Bookshop. It is a balmy night in Brisbane and um, we're all out on the back deck. The lights are beautiful, the plants are glistening uh, and it is um, quite warm. Uh, so if you're joining us from down south, you may actually enjoy the temperature that we have here tonight. We up here are waiting for autumn to kick in. That would be quite nice. Um, but so I'm just letting some final people in. As I do so though, I'd like to just remind everybody that you will be on um, mute tonight. So um, I will be asking for questions um, and I would love you to type them into the chat box, which is at the bottom of your screen. So um, if you do have any questions, even in the middle of, of the speeches, feel free to um, type them in and I will try to get to them as soon as possible at the end. Um, we may not get to everybody's questions, but hopefully um, we'll cover some ground. Um, and just to show you where the chat box is, I'm going to post a link in the chat box for everybody. Um, this link is a link to the book of the moment, to the adversary. So if you also are inspired to race off and purchase in the middle of the event tonight, there is the link for you. If not, you can um, hop onto Avid Reader afterwards and then you can order the book and we will post it anywhere that you may happen to be. Anyway, I think um, we have most of our, well, some of our guests here tonight and more will turn up soon, but um, I might just kick things off. I'm going to start by um, acknowledging that um, in this area here, we're meeting on Aboriginal land and it is um, the land of the Yagara and the Turrbal people. I would like to pay my deepest respects to their elders, past, present and emerging elders. I would also like to acknowledge that um, we're not just meeting um, on this land. We are meeting on the lands of many different Aboriginal peoples all over Australia tonight, which is very special. This, um, this land has been Aboriginal land for for as long as memory and it has always been storytelling land um, and this land was never, sovereignty was never ceded and um, I'd like to pay my respects to all of the elders around Australia on the lands that we are meeting on. Now without further ado, I would like to um, introduce you to the wonderful Christina Olsen. Christina Olsen is a journalist and an award-winning author of the novels Shell, in One Skin and The China Garden, and two works of nonfiction, Boy Lost and Kilroy Was Here. Chris Olsen is an avid reader favourite. Um, we really adore her, and I'm so glad to welcome her again here tonight to launch this book. Christina Olsen. Thank you, Chrissy. Um, I too would like to acknowledge the traditional people of these lands and thank them for this incredibly storied place that we get to live on and for the wisdom that they bring to us every day. Um, like Chrissy, I'd like you to all imagine that I'm, I've just got a lectern in front of me and I'll be referring to some notes as I go along. So when I look down, I'll be looking at my lectern. <laughs> um, I first of all have to say how delighted I am to be here to talk about the adversary, and not just because it's an exquisite new novel that you should all read, of course. Uh, but I guess I suppose, you know, like all old teachers and lecturers, I like to think they've been a terribly big and indelible influence on their students, <laughs> especially those who, like Ronnie, go on to be famous and very accomplished in their fields. And my first contact with Ronnie you might guess, uh, uh, and my strongest memory of him, actually, uh, was when he was a student in a creative writing non-fiction class I was teaching at QT here in Brisbane, back somewhere in the mists, the wild mists of the 2000s. Uh, Ronnie wrote a very funny and wonderful piece 
I remember, about zombie walk through Brisbane that year. And then he disappeared off to Melbourne to do all kinds of other marvellous things, which now I know included reading Helen Garner's Monkey Group and falling in love with the Fitzroy Baths. Um, in fact, Ronnie, you say in the book that there is, you know, about, about Monkey Group, you say there's no better book of voice or of moments by a living writer. And I have to agree, she'd done. Uh, She's a wonderful, wonderful writer, especially about Melbourne. And given the great achievement that the adversary is, maybe the terribly big and indelible influence wasn't sadly one semester of nonfiction, of my teaching in nonfiction <laughs> in Brisbane. Um, so I'll have to concede to Ghana, and not just to Ghana, um, but to other many great writers that have influenced you clearly you have done lots of reading amongst them Anita Bruckner I was delighted to see and hear she's also a great favorite of mine um, she's among many writers you cite um, and what's interesting for me is that these are really interior books I think books that speak from the inside out if you like uh, imprint they imprint themselves on you in that way as just as the adversary does so the adversary follows our unnamed protagonist. For those of you who don't know, I'm just going to give you a little rundown. Through one quite desultory, listless, sticky summer in Melbourne, we soon get to know him. He's earnest, but oddly aimless. A, a young gay man who wants but doesn't want. This strange, almost wanting, almost almost ready character was kind of instantly recognizable to me i have to say he's he's real he's in the flesh um he thinks seriously about things he thinks seriously about sex but he doesn't like bodies not really he's in fact almost phobic about physical intimacy um ronnie you yourself have described this character as peevish which i love a peevish character and ambivalent and slightly unhinged, as we all are, I think. Uh, but he lies around thinking compulsively about the unseen motives of others. Just wonderful descriptions. But his housemate, Dan, who he also thinks about a lot, who is much more functional and much more sane, probably, with a steady job and a boyfriend and actual volition, um, is intent on getting our hero out and about. This involves afternoons at the pool, nights at parties and dinners, and the character's own, frankly, hilarious and moving expeditions from Brunswick into the wilds of Richmond, and daringly to the beach. So the adversary has been described as a coming of age novel. And certainly this kind of stationary life lying about thinking about the motives of others is kind of emblematic, I reckon, of a certain time in our lives. Perhaps it's something we never grow out of, though. It's sort of intensified in those heady days of, of youth when your skin feels way too thin and when you, when you need to kind of penetrate the disguises and the covers of others to ensure you're at least a bit like them, not too much but enough to be normal. One of the aspects of this so masterfully, I reckon, on display in the novel is the play between the internal, external banter and angst on the one hand and the utterly serious business and about serious issues and consequences, what we actually do in our lives, what we actually do as against what we think. And while it's true that this protagonist um, doesn't do much at all, almost nothing except this bits of moving around amid the swirls of living and working and walking up going on, on all around him, those issues and consequences do rear up in the course of this getting out and about. 
for instance, the arrival of PrEP on the scene, as in pre-exposure for these, for anyone who doesn't know, pre-exposure prophylaxis for HIV um, of you equals you, the campaign to lift awareness about safe sex and undetectable viral loads, and of course, same-sex marriage, which no one can be excused for not knowing about. And yes, sure, there's nostalgia here, and I know, I think I know, that this was one of Ronnie's aims in a way to deliver this. And it's delightful for readers, I think, of all ages to be thrown back to their own youth, you know, at uni and at parties, in share houses or otherwise, into that kind of wash of desire mixed with fear of worldliness alongside innocence. Don't make the mistake though, however pleasurable and enticing it might be to assume Ronnie himself is walking about here in the narrator's shoes and in his head. I know, uh, Ronnie, that you are pretty determined not to use your own experiences and if, with this character and instead you've used 10 anonymous interviewees of Red uh, to help build them um, and the way they move around in the book. And I have to say, if no one else asks you a question about this later, I'm going to ask you about this because I find that a fascinating aspect of the, of the writing. And in this way, um, I think it's at once a very personal book and a very political one. Ronnie, I know, spent at least six years, nearly seven, writing it. And I've said to him before that it's very consoling to me to hear other people also take a long time to get a book written. And in that time, he drafted and redrafted and redrafted and he learned as he learned the characters and how they interacted and as his own world and the world of the book went through some quite convulsive change. This comes through in the adversary, partly in the thematic threads that pull in the aforementioned PrEP and U equals U and SSM, and all of which impinge on the life of the book and of the characters as they navigate not just partnering and jobs and real estate and food, well, it's Melbourne after all, but, but the politics of safety, I think, and of belonging. It's a seam of great gravity, I think, beneath the apparently casual meetings and exchanges uh, and the couplings um, that ground the book otherwise in a very uncertain world, in this very uncertain world that we're now living in ourselves. It's also, of course, about friendship, the kind of a hothouse, sharehouse kind, which, which are shining in gold when they work, intense, yes, and exposing, and therefore perfect for the gaze of the novelist. Perfect for this book, Ronnie, I think. Um, it'd be easy to see the book as one commentator, I think, playfully suggested, as a sex comedy about gay young men, a kind of naked Jane Austen, perhaps. But it's far too nuanced for that and ambiguous. And in fact, in fact, quite light on explicit sex scenes. So don't go to it for that. Though sexual tension runs electric right through the book. The scenes at the Fitzroy Baths, for instance, which I loved, I wanted them to go on and on. Um, the smooth white trunks worn by men, the careful placement of towels, the disguises, actually. The idea of disguise to me is another intriguing thread in the book. And for me, Christy and I were talking about this actually. For us, there's also definitely shades of bride's head we visited uh, here. In, but, you know, in the beautifully handled slivers of relationship angst and the gossip and intrigue and paranoia and the loose postures and posturing of young men in other people's houses, for instance, drinking and using piles of plush towels as they go. As in the world, there's lots of uncertainty, lots of ambiguity, as I've said before, and guesswork at play in this novel. And an overriding feeling that we are all, when, we, when it comes down to it, just guessing, just guessing. Reading the thoughts of others and coming to our own very subjective and almost nihilistic conclusions at times. 
This for me is the most reassuring of coming of age novels with a main character for our times. I mean, who better to lead us through this strange new world of ours than a young man who doesn't like to go out, who loves to be at home, even if that means many, many showers and many hours on his mobile phone. We're all very familiar with that world right now. So I think all of us, whether we're 20 or 40 or 60 or 80, can slip easily inside the head of this young man. It's a great pleasure to be in there. He's not sure of anything, really. Prodding tender spots in his heart for authenticity every day, which is all he wants, really. To know he's as all right as anyone else. And finally, that they'll all just leave him alone. Ronnie, it's a long way from zombie walks, which was, of course, great in its own way. <laughs> but this, this reveals you, this book reveals you as a true original. It's beautifully crafted. It's tender, very tender. That was one of my favourite parts about it. And insightful. A window into our own heads, into everyone's heads. Thank you for it. And huge congratulations. Yay. Thank you so much, Chris. Um, that was absolutely um, well said. Um, this is the book, The Adversary, that we're discussing today. Isn't it a thing of beauty? Like, it is. Even like the, the inside yellow flaps. It's so gorgeous. Mm. Um, and reading it um, in, in such a beautiful physical package uh, and rereading it, um, I have to admit you are spot on um, with your assessment of this book. It is, it feels like a classic. It feels like something that is, um, you know, that has lasting chops. It, it feels like something like The, Gate, the Great Gatsby that um, it will just kind of linger on in people's memories and we will keep coming back to it. It feels like it will last when many other books are just of the moment and will not last. So this is a very lasting book for me. So congratulations, Ronnie. Now I'm going to um, introduce Ronnie to the audience. So Ronnie Scott is a lecturer in creative writing at RMIT and a writer of essays and criticisms. Uh, the Adversary is his first novel um, and we congratulate him for it. Welcome, Ronnie. Thank you so much. Um, thank you both so much. Chrissy and Chris, uh, that was, yeah, that was really beautiful and strange to hear. Um, we were talking right before, um, before Chrissy let people in, uh, into the Zoom about how, um, how interesting and, and unusual and always unusual it is to hear other people talk about your own, your, your work to you and how it tells you things that, that were kind of powering it underneath, but that you didn't necessarily know how to articulate um, to yourself. And I just, yeah, I, I had one of those moments when Chris, in her incredibly lovely, generous speech, um, spoke about guesswork, because I've heard this character called paranoid before, and I've heard him called um, self-conscious before and insecure, and I think that he is all of those things. But the idea of guesswork and the idea of kind of moving through the world, um, yeah, guessing is, I think, much the, the closest that I've heard um, to something that that describes the spirit that I was going for. So something that, um, that I think is really uncertain um, and really kind of dealing with the, un with the invisible and dealing with uncertainty, but also um, hopefully with a little bit of buoyancy as well, um, which I think is, the, is probably the idea behind guesswork. Um, the idea that there, that there are things out there and that you might find them um, or you might, um, yeah, you might, you might decide on the terms in which to, with which to regard them. Um, yeah, I did take a long time writing this book. Um, I, I studied under Chris uh, at QUT in Brisbane, and that would have been 2003, 2004, um, I think. And I remember that creative nonfiction class very, very well. I remember Chris being an incredible example of a serious writer um, and a serious writer that was that was interested in things like structure and things like like voice and tone and that kind of thing that um, that maybe if you're just starting out as a writer, you don't know, apply to things like nonfiction. And that was so influential to me. And I did take that to, to Melbourne when I, I started publishing writing. Um, and at the same time, I worked really briefly at Avid Reader in Brisbane um, with Chrissy. And Chrissy was also an amazing example of 
um, of a serious writer and a writer who was seriously interested and engaged um, in, in the life of reading um, in a way that was really inspiring to me as well. And they're both such supportive, incredible mentors in different ways. Um, and it's really lovely to be launching it with the two of you. So thanks for having me. And yeah, I, I'm sad that we don't get to do it at Avid Reader itself in Brisbane, but it's lovely to do it here as well. Um, so I'll read a little bit from the adversary uh, and, then, and then talk about it a little bit. And as Chrissy said, um, questions in the chat window uh, if, you, if you have them. Um, I'll read the Fitzroy Pool scene because it was mentioned um, and because I think that, uh, yeah, there's a lot of guesswork in it. So it's kind of right for right now. So to set it up, um, it's not at the very start of the book, but it's on page 45. So there's a little bit of setup. Um, the narrator who lives with his housemate, Dan, uh, he's very, he's sort of met Dan at a point in their lives where you're just ready to have found your people and you, maybe because you've gone through that process with someone, um, you are very invested in who they are. He's very curious about Dan. Um, and also at the start of the book, they've maybe realized in slightly different ways that their friendship needs to change, um, that they need to develop their relationship in some way if it's going to survive. Um, and Dan's found a boyfriend named Lachlan. Um, the narrator is, uh, is, deeply and personally offended by changes that he sees taking place in Dan, um, including ones that seem like they've come from this boyfriend, Lachlan. Uh, and there's there's a couple of other people who they've met the night before as well. So the narrator, does he's very reluctant. He does not want to be dragged out of the house, but he's been convinced to go to Fitzroy Pool in the spirit of summer. Uh, and he's gonna encounter some of these people here again. All right. Before I let my membership to Brunswick Baths expire, a trainer had written on the whiteboard, remember, summer bodies are made in winter. It sounded like an old saw trotted out by some Scandinavian detective waiting for the lake to thaw and divulge its many bodies, creating a grisly wealth of summer overtime. Now though, climbing the bleachers at the Fitzroy pool, I saw it had a troubling meaning of a different kind. While I had been imagining this Scandinavian detective, other boys had been taking the advice as it was meant, girding themselves against the risk of sagginess and scrawniness and readying their bodies to greet the sunny world. Dan and Lachlan were already up there on the bleachers, perched on towers, um, as Chris mentioned, and gazing at me through their sunglassed eyes. Neither of their towers looked particularly beachy, but instead seemed lifted from some fancy hotel in the same thick royal green as their dressing gowns. I couldn't imagine how warm and lovely it would be to cover myself in these towels in dead of winter, nor how awful it would be to do this after exiting the water on a too hot, windless day, sweating and chlorine and sticky with sunscreen, squinting up at the gym complex that hulked over the pool. Like many aspects of Dan's life under Lachlan, the towels seemed like souvenirs from a weird other world. I nodded to them, saw a space on the tier below them, reasonably man-sized, and made my way towards it. To spread a beach towel on these bleachers was to perform an art. It required a keen eye for towel-shaped opportunity and no undue squeamishness for disadvantaging others. As I dropped my own scrappy blue-green spotted towel and kicked at it to spread it, the shape beside my towel rolled over and revealed itself. Inscrutable behind its own pair of sunglasses, these ones dramatically large and bug-eyed. I paused mid-crouch. Hey, I said. He paused too. Hey, Chris L said. I looked up at Dan and Lachlan. We had already said hi to each other, but I was getting into the groove. Hey, I said. Hey, Lachlan said. My sunglasses were always cheap and the last ones I'd bought had broken several months ago. There was nothing left to say and nothing left to do but take off my shoes and shirt so as to complete the sense of exposure. There were more gaps on the bleachers than it looked from below, but it was hard with noise and dense with sizzly bodies. I was lucky to have found a space at all. Only when the American was halfway up the bleachers did I realize my terrible mistake. 
As if to reintroduce the idea of his Americanness, he was holding two burger shapes in Lord of the Fries wrappers. Obviously having left the bleachers in order to pick them up, his towel draped off his shoulders in a pretense of modesty. He was flip-flopping up the bleachers in a pair of thongs. I held my hands out, palms up, sorry. Hey, no friends in the towel game, he said. This is Vivian, said Dan. We've met, said Vivian. Yeah, I said, rolling over and squinting up at Dan. We are friends in the towel game. So his name was Vivian, which I vaguely knew was one of those names that was actually old timey masculine, like Shirley or Evelyn. And only in the present world did it sound slightly deranged. I was trying not to think about my view of Vivian's crotch, which was encased in smooth white trunks that somehow revealed both everything and nothing. Dan was in one of his unimpressible moods. What's the towel game, he said, when it was entirely clear what we were talking about. It was interesting how that idiom, no friends in the X game, was something they must have had in America too, which only made it seem particularly pointless that Dan was pretending not to know what it meant. It's this, I said, and said, Chris L, would you mind moving your towel? Chris L swooped his lenses over the bleachers over the day. I don't mind at all, he said. I smiled at Dan. Thank you, Chris L. And when he'd done so, I moved my towel, which made it kind of bunchy, but the towel and I were both still dry, so bunchiness was fine. There, I said, and Vivian set his own towel down next to me, stretched it out as far as possible, and sat down where he could. I was very impressed with Vivian and Chris L for going along with me, although I was unsure what I had been trying to demonstrate. And that's the towel game, I said, and refolded my legs. Vivian passed a burger to Chris L over my body, causing just a drop of mayo to fall beside my chest. We teetered on a verge made up of chlorine and the sun, now revved up, now satiated, now tired, now flushed. We were parched and oily. We were sun drunk. I was very happy to have found my new friends, but I wondered if I liked them mainly because they were not really talking and because all I had to do in order to be their friend was sit between them and also not talk. So, said Vivian, how do you know Chris L? Chris L looped into a little pretzel of social watchfulness, unknowable behind the bright black surface of his shades, but projecting a freaky total awareness. We're friends, said Chris L simply. I widened my eyes in complete surprise, then narrowed them in calculation. Chris L whipped his neck dramatically towards Dan. Vivian's from New York, he said. Well, I live in New York, said Vivian. I died inside and curled over into a toothpaste worm, covering my ears as totally as possible without looking obvious and rude. I'd always thought that my ideal boyfriend would live in a hard to reach location on a voyage or in a jail. Imagine having a boyfriend who lived in New York always, a hard to reach location if there ever was one. A place of close streets, pink buildings, good things and bad. Don't smoke on the fire escape, pick up after your dog. It seemed tragic and interesting to fly over the world with no sense of responsibility for where you might end up. The idea was powerful and stupid. Was this what a crush felt like, brainless and harsh? It felt right and wrong at the same time, which meant it had to be wrong. I couldn't like Vivian, we barely said six words. I just hadn't slept with someone in a very long time and wet cement and chlorine had a provoking quality. I had to do something before I did something more drastic, like find a strange excuse to lean over and touch his leg. Chris L, I said, interrupting him mid-sentence. He'd been saying something about guys here or guys there, but when I held out my hand, he tilted his head towards it. He took it decisively. His mouth went very firm. It was the first time in a long time that I had held someone's hand and I was surprised at its dryness and its toughness. Where are we going, he asked me. We walked down the bleachers. That was kind of boring, Chris L whispered. Thanks for saving me. The day was hot, the walk was short, then we were at the water. No problem, I said. He jumped into the pool. He came up for air laughing and saying something else, but I was already walking back up the bleachers, looking up at Vivian, who was looking at me. And that's my reading. Um, thanks for, the, yeah, silent claps are good. Um, thank you, Chrissy. I, um, what can I say? I, I, I wanted to write a story that was that was queer and that was specifically gay that had a friendship at the center and that developed in a very certain way um, a, a way that was that was more like real friendships than than the kinds of um, 
uh, I guess that then the way that that friendships sometimes develop in stories when they're subjected to the same structures as romantic or professional relationships or uh, or or other other kinds of ways that people can encounter themselves encounter each other in stories um, which is that friendships I think they do change and they do have have dramatic stakes and they do have um, things happen in them um, and they end and they uh, and they get better and you know all the things that can happen to people happen to friendships but um, but I think more often they change in unspoken ways and they they change in accordance with other things that happen in our lives as well so for me like I, I wanted to put Dan and the narrator at the center of the story, but I also um, knew that I needed something else to push the story forward. And so one of the reasons that it took me so long to, to do it is, that it is that I had to find kind of the right foils like Chris L and like Lachlan and Vivian and another character called the Richmond Man, he doesn't have a name, um, who would kind of be counterpoints to, the, to these main characters and sort of let the reader understand them in a slightly different way. Um, and I think that, that the pool scene is fun to me because it's where they come together in a space and it's where the frictions and tensions kind of start, start happening, which kind of keep going throughout the book. Um, yeah, and I think that the, that's probably what I want to say about it. Um, are there questions? Um, well, I have one anyway. Um, and that is... Did you really, like, it's such a sense of place. This book is, you know, such a Melbourne book and such a, a solid sense of place. Was it, did it ever um, occur to you that you might set it not in such a specific location? What was, I mean, why did you decide to go with the idea that it was these very specific suburbs and that you were being specific about the place? Um, I really wanted to set it in, um in either Fitzroy or Brunswick. Actually, it was set in Fitzroy for a long time, but I realized it made more economic sense for them to be in Brunswick, um, especially if the narrator was gonna have this summer where he um, where he wasn't working um, and where he was on Centrelink and where he was sort of subsidized by a housemate, um, someone that he was living with. And even then, actually, I think that, that in 2020, that doesn't make as much sense as it, as it made in 2016 or 2017. I think there's a bit of a fantasy element to that. Um, but from, and really, I wanted to set it, set it in Fitzroy because it's close to Brunswick. I lived in Brunswick at the time, and uh, and I kind of wanted to get out of my own backyard, um, but still be able to write about a place that you kind of know a little bit about. And then when I set it in Brunswick, as I was leaving Brunswick, I just I had that sense of nostalgia that um, that Chris was talking about, where I just wanted to sort of capture the place that I had actually lived in through this, these slightly different eyes. And I had heaps of fun um, making the plot because because it's it's a quiet book, not a whole lot happens, but there is a plot and there is there are kind of urgent scenes where someone has to get from Brunswick to Richmond and only has $50 in his pocket and it's New Year's Eve and things like that. Um, and I really, really wanted to do something that was like place specific and where I, I love books where plot de depends on the actual conditions of the world around the characters. Um, yeah, so I, I wanted to do that. It works really, really well. And even though I don't know the, the places as well as you do, they definitely, um, they certainly jumped out as having their own personalities, these particular suburbs, which was great. Uh, I've got another question kind of related to space as well. So um, Chris, possibly Chris L has asked, um, when I was 22, I moved from Brisbane to Melbourne to go to university and immediately felt I had found a place where I could be completely myself. I stayed more than 30 years yet always felt like a Queenslander. Have you felt similar similar divided loyalties at all? And <laughs> you might ever write a novel set in Brisbane. Um, I don't feel divided loyalties. I feel two really strong loyalties and I don't feel like they're in opposition. I think, um, I, I, I think that Brisbane and Melbourne seem to think of each other really kindly. Um, that, that might not be the case when you're, uh, maybe I, I have kind of, rose-colored memories of the way that people thought of Melbourne when I lived in Brisbane, maybe which is loathed up there. Um, but I think that, um, that they're just such different places. And um, yeah, it's, it, was, it was strange writing a book about a 21-year-old character. Um, and, and you don't get his age in the book, but he's about 20, 21. 
um, set in Melbourne because I was that age in Brisbane. Um, like I, I was at uni in Brisbane. I was in a sort of different set of circumstances than this character. Um, and so part of the, the work of writing the book is imagining your, like what you would have been like if you'd been in a different social circle um, and in different circumstances and trying to see Melbourne through those like very intense, like identity forming eyes, which I didn't quite have when I moved to, when I moved here, I was kind of, I, I sort of had different like life projects going on. Um, yeah, so, so it feels like a Brisbane book to me in some ways, but, um, but that's probably not a fair thing to say. It's just a feeling that I have. You don't think you're going to write a Brisbane novel at some point? I'd love to write a Brisbane novel at some point. I know what it's called as well. Um, but I, yeah, that's like a little ways away. Um, so there's a, a question here from Lorelai. Uh, can you talk about the editing process? What changed since the first draft? And thank you and congrats and I love you, Ronnie. <laughs> I don't know this woman at all. She's <laughs> come out of the woodwork. Um, thank you, Lorelai, for that great question. Uh, I... So the, the first draft that I wrote was actually like completely different because I knew that I wanted to write fiction after I'd tried, after I'd been working as a nonfiction writer and an editor. And I, um, to do that, I wrote like 10 linked short stories. It was going to be like that kind of novel where you sort of go between lots of different styles. And it was re but really, that was me teaching myself how to do like scenes and characters and things like that. Um, and there was this um this short story that um that i heard from other people was like was the good one and it was the one that i connected to as well so i worked with that like i i ended up expanding it and extending it and so it meant that, that this novel which is still very short like it's a short book um it only has six characters and they're all really like pretty similar to each other as well it's a like a limited scope kind of book um it it grew exponentially like first it had three characters and then it had four characters and then it had five characters and finally that's kind of how that's how it developed um it was like short then a little bit less short then a little bit longer but it was a different book every time so it was like when i when i got to the end of a draft that was when i understood what the real questions were that i was trying to answer and then you kind of have that period where you walk away and you give it to other people to read and get their feedback and their ideas and yeah and, and you sort of reapproach it from a fresh um, from a fresh place so it also like everything changed in the world outside the book as as Chris was saying um, in her speech so in the in the seven years that I took to write it uh, like public expressions of gay life in Australia changed dramatically because of things like prep and safe schools and same-sex marriage um, and uh, this historical wave of um, representations of the of the AIDS crisis um, all, like, all kinds of things actually that just made it really interesting and challenging to think, well, how would a 21 year old um, kind of critical person be reacting to all these things? And then like asking that question in 2017, when I was sort of halfway through it was different to asking that question in 2019, right before we sent it off to the printer. So uh, there's a conversation in the book that happens uh, sort of around the negotiation of, of HIV status and PrEP which I changed like after the proof, like the, the advanced reader copy that goes out to reviewers and things like that. And I just realized that that was kind of the, the sense that I got of a particular kind of prejudice that was in the kind of community that these characters are in, that, that, that made total sense at the start of last year, but by the end of last year, it just felt really, really wrong. And it's not, it's not necessarily even that it changed that much. It's that my, you know, it could just be that my perception and awareness of it changed but I had to like rewrite that scene and make that conversation about something else. So there are copies that are floating around out there that reflect a slightly different sense of how HIV is talked about um, among young gay people. There's a couple of more questions here. So one's from Lucinda. Um, Hi Ronnie, on Bride's Head Revisited and the reference to Vivian, um, Evelyn old fashioned names um, have early 20th century British writers war or wolf um, the waves been any influence on you at all? Um, I so the yeah they have actually, um, and I think that some of it's kind of unconscious. Like like Brides had revisited, which by the way, like Chrissy said that to me maybe six months ago, and it was one of the first things that people said to me about the the final novel, and it was just the nicest thing that has that has ever happened. Um, 
it meant a lot and it's stuck with me. It's, I think that Brideshead Revisited is one of those books that, that does kind of get mainlined into you. Um, I think that before I'd, before I'd read Brideshead Revisited, I sort of, you, you have a sense of, of the kinds of feelings it's going to cover and you have a sense of the kind of complications that are, that are gonna go on and the kinds of class, class differences and the kind of simmering sexuality that it will have. And you have a sense of, the, of its relationship to history and it's nostalgic, but but sort of bruised tone. So I wasn't thinking about it consciously, but it's it's one of those stories that I think has a real impact in the way that people see the world. Um, and then the waves by Virginia Woolf, um, the, which I've read. I um, that's not the Virginia Woolf book that I think of um, most often. The one that I think of most often is Orlando, um, because it's this really interesting experience of like of being a person in time. Um, like or, or like not a person in in time, but uh, but like a fictional construct in time, and I I know what you mean. I know why you would ask about the waves because it's about a group of friends, um, and because it's really sort of associative and symbolic. But I think that that's one of those books as well that like seeps into the culture in a different way. And people write realist fiction in 2020 that is totally indebted to like strange modernist experiments like that but we don't even think about it anymore um, because it just changed the way that people write sentences and the kinds of things that they write about, the kinds of things that you're sort of allowed to focus on in fiction. So yeah, I, I, um, I guess like whenever you're writing about feelings um, and you're like expressing the way that a character perceives the world, you're thinking about Wolf in a, in a way or you're indebted to Wolf in a way. All right, we've got another question. This one's from Harry. Uh, so, Ronnie, what were the challenges in writing for a different generation of teenagers? Um, what was the same and what was different from your own adolescence? And how did you ensure the characters' voices and actions were authentic? Yeah, I, that's a great question. Um, thanks, Harry. I, um, I mean, I'm around people in this age group a lot uh, because, because of academic work um, and just as well because of various other kind of um, like literary community stuff, like like I think that the literary communities are ones that have like a just a lot of young people involved in them, um, and and you get an opportunity to read their words a lot, um, and to hear the way that they talk about critical concepts, and so like I think that that a lot of the way that the characters were informed comes from comes from like a real person over here and a real person over there and a real person over there, and I also um, as Chris Chris Olson mentioned did interviews that helped inform the book and even though they I don't think any of them was with a 21 year old they were with people who were younger than me um, I'm a you know I'm in my mid-30s and the character is 21 so there is a big gulf in the way that that, that the world is perceived and the kinds of things they focus on and the, the challenges are I think the challenge is just letting go of any kind of authentic idea of how people talk and think like like I think that um, that the the character probably does like think and speak in a way that is more like uh, someone in their thirties in some ways, and then more like someone in their twenties in other ways. And I think in fiction, we can kind of buy into those weird like melds, like mind melds of different voices. Um, yeah. And I also kind of thought about ways that he would speak that came from other characters in the book. So he's really influenced by Dan, who's a, who's a, who like talks and thinks in a really specific way. And he gets a lot of his phrases from Dan as well. It's um, the, the way that the character speaks is... Can I ask a question? What's that? Can what? I ask a question? Yeah, absolutely. Can I, can I push in? Yes, please do. <laughs> Ronnie, we were talking, I, was, I mentioned earlier that, you know, that I've been uh, a teacher of yours and now, of course, you're teaching uh, young people to write. And I'm interested to hear about your experience of being a teacher of writing at the same time as writing. You know, that old adage about you teach best what you most need to learn. And I found that to be true sometimes when I was teaching writing. Um, but there's also, of course, that dynamic of, of trying to write when, you're, when you have the demands of, of teaching as well. Um, how, did that, how was that over a, you know, a period of time? Yeah, thanks. Um, that's a great question. I uh, like how I, I so first of all, how to how to balance the demands of teaching with the demands of writing. 
Um, I don't know what, what you're like, Chris, but I, I can't do anything after a class. Like if I have a class that, that goes from 10 a.m. to 12 noon, I can do admin, but I can't do anything creative because it drains you in, a, in the same way. Um, uh, which makes you think like writing is kind of like a performance and teaching is kind of like a performance. So it takes some of the same spirit, even though it's using different bits of your brain. And uh, uh, I don't know, they're both, they both involve thinking about other people and communicating or, or something like that. Um, but I, I've always had fantasies of being able to be the kind of writer who could just write for 40 minutes at the end of the day or between classes. And I, I think that maybe if I had a really serious external change, I could do that. Like people I know who have small kids can can do that. They learn pretty quickly that they can write in those little bursts because um, they because they have to. But I've never had that pressure, so I have to write at the start of the day. And even if I had a class at 10 a.m., I would have to wake up really early and do a couple hours. Yeah. Um, but I think that that's an okay way to have a writing life because I can never spend a whole day writing. Yeah. Um, I only have a couple of good hours, or if I'm really far into a project or I have a deadline. I can do half a day, but but I just can't have the faucet turned on for for all that time. I just I get a bit stupid, so it's better to have something else to do at the end of the day. Um, and then what what was what's it like to yeah to to be influenced by people in classrooms while you're doing your work and engaging with all their work? I think it, it makes you a better writer because um, like the the thing that we always tell students in a workshop in class is that. You learn, so you learn a lot by having the experience of like 15 people comment on your draft uh, and having to sort out all of those contradic that contradictory feedback and think about what's right for you and what's not and what people might really mean by a certain comment and all that. That's a really great kind of exposing vulnerable feeling. Yeah. But I think that you learn as much more from having to talk about other people's writing and to think well, what's this really about and what's stopping it from answering that question that it's really about um and thinking what are what are some of the weird ways that this writer who's very different from me might approach this question and what happens if i give them a little bit of advice but they sort of feed it through their writing machine and it always comes out with different results so i think i think that writing is always just about having options and it's just great when you come up with a with a problem and something that you don't know how to solve and just being able to think, well, there are all of these ways that I could go about answering this question. There are all these different things I could try. And so it's helpful being around other people who are solving all of those problems at the same time. Yeah, thank you. We've got a, um, a, it's not really a question, I suppose, for you, Ronnie, but a question from Lisa McGuire who says, who asks if there are any signed copies available at Avid. And of course, there aren't because we can't get Ronnie in. But what we are hoping to do, and this is probably a nice note to end the night on, is that we're um, all of these writers who have put so much work into their books and they're being released at this very strange time where they can't actively promote their books the way that um, other writers have been able to um, when you can get out and go to bookshops and do talks. Um, we're hoping to have a festival of cancelled writing um, after we're all allowed to meet. So to get the, the books that would have been launched into the world um, and we would have had them through Avid to get everybody together for a weekend um, of discussing on panels about um, what it's like to have their books out. So I'm hoping that we can get Ronnie um, to visit us uh, at the end of this all. So if you do buy your book from Avid now, um, you will be able to bring it in um, at the Festival of Cancel Writing, hopefully, and um, Ronnie will be able to sign it for you. It's such um, an amazing book. I really do recommend that you, um, that you order it um, and that you read it and that you get your book club to read it because it's something that you do want to talk to people about. It feels like a classic. Um, I do want people to um, put their hands together for Ronnie and to raise a glass for this wonderful book. Um, and congratulations on it. Such a great, great piece of work. Um, I do recommend it to everybody. I am going to um, turn everybody on now, so um, in the nicest possible way. I'm going to um, unmute you all and there will be a cacophony of um, crazy people chatting. So um, if there's anything, any last words from Chris or Ronnie, you can only say it now because otherwise you will be drowned out by everybody else. Can I have very Thank you. 
Thanks. Thanks, Chris. Can I, can I really quickly say I've only just changed it to grid view because I, I didn't think I'd be able to focus on Chris and Chrissy if I didn't have just the one person on the screen. So I've just seen all the people who are here and it's great to see you. Thanks for coming. Great. And now we can all say thanks to Ronnie. So I'm just going to unmute you all and we can all cheer and clap. <laughs> Thanks, Thanks, Thanks. Thanks. How does it feel sitting there with the glass of wine now after that's all done? <laughs> Pretty good. Yeah. 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 Oh, it should. You've done well. Thanks, Thanks Jody. I um yeah, I feel good. I I think it feels like a launch at Avid, even though it's not, which is really really strange but i don't know it doesn't feel as um it doesn't feel as digital and isolated as you would expect because <laughs> we're all nice people yeah, we're all nice people. yeah. Does everyone... sorry chrissy go i just said hello lorelei i just saw lorelei there. yeah lorelei yeah lorelei lisa mcguire matt Lowe. hi hi how are you good how are you yeah, thank you for describing why I can't write when I get home from uh, school every day. That That's one of the best descriptions I've heard of why right. I can't get any output out. <laughs> Can you do it before? Too much creativity lost. <laughs> Can you do it at the start of the day? Um, I fret about not having prepared lessons, to be honest. But I, I, for years I've tried to do that one. But, I, you know, I'll, there's moments I write, there's moments I don't write, you know, it's like... <laughs> Okay, everyone. Well, thank you very much for coming, and thank you, Ronnie, and thank you, Chris. Welcome. Thanks, everyone. Join us for some avid events soon, everyone. See ya. Bye. See ya.